Good morning. Very excited to be back here this morning. Uh, looks like we will be finishing up Revelation 9, beginning 10. As I said before, Revelation 9 and 10 are going to go much faster. Apparently that means about a month uh, for each one of these, but that's how that goes. We'll slow way down again, don't worry, Revelation chapter 11. So, I encourage you to follow along. We'll dive right in. If you'd open your Bibles to Revelation 8, I'm going to be recapping the trumpet judgments just so we're on the same page because we're about to get to the seventh, uh, well, eventually. So, having all said all that, as you're finding your way to Revelation, let's open in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for your grace and love in Christ Jesus. I'm thankful, Lord, for the life that we have in Christ, the, the guarantee of eternal paradise with you just by faith in your finished work. Thank you, Lord, for doing that work. Thank you, Lord, for making us who we are in Christ and giving us that new identity in Christ. And I thank you for giving us the end from the beginning, that we can answer those itching questions in the backs of our minds about how does this all end and when is it, well, not that we know exactly when, but when, what happens when. So I'm thankful for this timeline of events. Thankful, Lord, that you've given us your full word. And I pray, as always, that your spirit guides us into the understanding and wisdom you would have us to gain today. Uh, help us to be equipped with your word, that we may answer those with questions, uh, helping us all to continue building upon that foundation, which is Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, Revelation 8. Just to go over these trumpet judgments. In Revelation 8, chapter 1, is the opening of the seventh seal, and there's silence about the space of half an hour. In that seventh seal, when that's open, it's opening up these seven trumpet judgments. And once we get to the seventh trumpet judgment, when that sounds, it's inaugurating those seven bowl or vial judgments. So all of these things are built one upon the other, and I just wanted to catch us up here with these trumpet judgments, remind us of all the wrath that is being poured out in the beginning of the tribulation period. So in Revelation 8, the seven seals open. The first trumpet sounds down in verse 7. It is hail, fire mingled with blood, and those things were cast upon the earth to the tune of a third of the trees were burnt up and all the green grass was burnt up. Devastating. And you can imagine the chaos happening with the livestock and the animals and correlate back to uh, chapter 6 with the fourth seal and the rider on the pale horse, which is death, killing with pestilence and with famine and with beasts of the earth. Okay, all this just tend, this makes more and more sense as we go through it. The second, oh, and then we talked, of course, about the blood and why that was there, just to remind us the importance of the blood and the life is in the blood, and God is rewarding to man according to his deeds. Verse 8, then, is the second trumpet judgment. It, it was, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire cast to the sea. And a third part of the sea became blood. The third part died inside the sea, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, this likely means globally that's happening, taking down a third of all maritime life uh, in a moment. I just let it say what it says, some sort of catastrophic event like a meteor falling to the earth or an asteroid falling to the earth. Uh, there's all sorts of people sounding alarms about that all the time, right? Uh, and solar flares and that sort of thing. I've been caught up in that for a while. Well, not for a while. I used to be. I'm not so much into that anymore. Uh, but it's out there. There are people watching for that sort of thing. But at some point, it is going to happen. And we looked at the Chicxulub crater just to get an idea of how big of a thing uh, that was and how much of an impact it had. So you can imagine the devastation even from that. Verse 10, the third angel sounded, a great star fell from heaven. Highly likely this is a spiritual being. Uh, and it tainted all of the fresh water. And by all, of course, I mean a third part, because that's what that says. Uh, but it's the fresh water that was affected here. And it was named Wormwood. And the water was made bitter so that many men died there in verse 11. And we think back again to Mark 16 when Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. And one of those things was they can drink a deadly thing and not be hurt by it. 
That means something. They're going to go through this time frame because that was two and four Israel, that what most call the Great Commission was two and four Israel for their kingdom to come upon the earth. And they would have those signs that follow them that believe, for the Jews require a sign. It all makes sense with that sort of thing. And it's linked here in Revelation chapter 8. Uh, verse 12, the fourth angel sounded and smote a third part of the celestial bodies. We'll just put it that way. And so I jokingly kept saying, and will continue to keep saying, how will you know the day or the hour when a third part is destroyed by that trumpet judgment? It's going to be hard to tell time and seasons, especially with all the chaos that's happening during the tribulation period. Even though God tells them it's going to be seven years, it's going to be hard to keep track of exactly what those seven years are with current calendars and timepieces and all of that. So there is that. And then, as if that wasn't bad enough, these next three trumpet judgments are, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> so get ready for what's coming. Uh, the fifth angel, verse 1 of chapter 9 sounds, and then a star falls to the earth with the key of the bottomless pit. And I brought up that apparently since Christ hold the key to death in Hades back in Revelation chapter 1, he hands this key to whoever this angel is, to go and open this bottomless pit, the abode of the demons, the abyss. We spent some time talking about that. And let's loose these bizarre-looking things, which are described as locusts with the power of scorpions. Right, and so they go about stinging men on the earth that don't have the seal of God. And the whole uh, power that they have is to torment for five months. Torment so bad that they want to die but can't. That's really bad. Now, you know that my wife is dealing with some things. That's why she is not here this morning with uh, the pain that would have been happening if she would, it just hurts to sit for too long. So to be in the van that long just wasn't going to happen. That's bad. <laughs> but this is a hundred times worse. So bad that you just, not you, of course, but man just wants to die and scripture is very clear, death will flee from them. No, you may not. Yikes. That would definitely equate to a woe, uh, like it was said there at the end of chapter 8. And the locusts were described, we looked at a few artist rendition of who, what they might look like, which is just bizarre, because we don't see anything like that in this world, and yet there are these uh, evil spirits, we could call them, that are sent forth to go and do this deed, to torment men for these five months. And now, Let's read the rest of Revelation 9, beginning in verse, well, I guess 12, because that's the first woe. It says, one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Verse 13, and the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day, and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And that's the Greek term anthropos, not just males, but all of mankind. Verse 16, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, or in other words, 200 million, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them do they, they do hurt. <clears throat> and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So we began to talk about this a couple of weeks ago. First of all, pointing out how God works in order. There are certain things he's going to inaugurate at specific times throughout history, we could argue, but also here in the future that's going to be happening. So when this sixth angel is going to sound, he says, uh, when they did sound, verse 14, the order then is to loose those four angels which were bound in the river Euphrates. 
And they were prepared for this specific moment to do the specific thing that we just read. So we could look at that a couple of different ways. One, God is sovereign. Two, these horrible sounding looking things that do amazing feats of destruction. Struggling with some terms here because I don't want to make it sound good, right? It's terrible, awful, those, those terms work, uh, what they can do, but they have limits. God only allows them a certain time, a certain amount, a third, right? So we can look at it that way as well. God is still sovereign. God is still all-powerful. God knows how he ought to render to every man according to his works, right? I know a lot of people have fears about this sort of thing or fears about being in this tribulation period. Those people, if you have those fears, read the epistles to the Thessalonians. They went through the exact same thing. I don't think anyone here has that kind of fear, but just in case you do, that's what the people in Thessalonica, Thessalonica, excuse me, thought. And so Paul explained to them, you're not in that tribulation period. Here's what has to happen before you get into that tribulation period, and I'm going to talk about that later this morning. Okay, so we won't go into this period. We won't see one second of it. We have a blessed hope, right, that we're going to be caught up together in the clouds with them that believe, those that have died in Christ, will rise up first, those that are alive and remain, hopefully us, right? Hopefully today. I always say that every time. Uh, but we'll be caught up together in the clouds, we'll be changed in, the, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and we shall be with the Lord forever. So I'm sort of mixing and matching 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, but all of that talks of the same event, which ironically talks about the last trumpet. So you know I'm going to be talking about that too when we get to the seventh trumpet. And I'm sorry for that Wisconsin accent slip. Oh, you know there. I heard it come out. I can't stop it. <laughs> Will that change too? <laughs> That's a good question. Will that change too? I don't know. I don't know about because uh, uh, the, there's two verses that I think of. Uh, well, not even just verses. One verse in, in the book of Acts that talks of all language of the earth having significance. I think that's in Acts 17, the Marshall Address. But then, of course, before the Tower of Babel, all the earth had one language. Is God going to restore that? I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Or maybe we can just speak all languages because why not, right? So it could be kind of fun. If I did this whole message in that youper kind of accent, I don't think anyone would take it seriously, <laughs> be able to listen to it, although I could. Uh, youpers would love it, right? Or northern Wisconsinites, they talk like that too. I hear it occasionally out of my mouth. I'm like, wow, that's a pretty strong accent. But I never hear it otherwise. Anyway, <laughs> we digress. Um, oh, okay, so we had to put this to numbers, and we tried to equate that population. The third uh, of men were going to die here, especially coupling that with what was written in the seal judgments when a quarter of the earth's population would die by uh, death and Hades riding about, just collecting the dead as we read there too. It's something to the tune of, uh, I missed my numbers, there it is, of somewhere between 3.325 billion and 4.7 billion, depending on when you take those percentages, right, or when you take the fractions. Now my kids love that, it's what they're learning in school. Uh, everyone's favorite, right, fractions and, and that sort of thing. But still, that's a lot of numbers. That's a lot of people. Very high numbers, staggering to try to imagine. Uh, the population will be decimated, and everything is just like out the window. We can imagine all the chaos that's going to be going on during this time frame. So that was the sixth trumpet. We got through six trumpets, and the seventh trumpet is yet coming. Uh, we're not going to hear about that for a while, but got to reiterate this is the first half of the tribulation period. Okay? The first half of the tribulation period, we'll see the population of the earth get cut in half, or more than half, depending on, again, when the percentages are accounted for. Really bad. Okay? And, and to point out, I know that there are some that hold to a mid-tribulational rapture, meaning at the midpoint of the tribulation period, when the mark of the beast is issued, when the beast will read about in Revelation chapter 13 comes to his full power. When Satan indwells the son of perdition and declares himself as God, that's when the rapture takes place. No, it's not. Hey, that doesn't line up with the rest of Scripture. And uh, hopefully I've presented enough evidence from Scripture to conclude 
that the only recourse from Scripture is a pre-tribulational rapture event. Okay, so hopefully we're all clear about that. There's more coming in chapter 11 that proves that the son of perdition, not in his superhuman, I guess, kind of state yet, is already on the earth at the beginning. Okay? The son of perdition is revealed. We'll talk about that in 2 Thessalonians 2 shortly. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So all of these plagues take place, and yet when we read in Revelation 9, uh, verse 20, that the rest of the men which were not killed by, by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. And it goes on to talk about idolatry. So then we had to look at what Scripture said about idolatry, and we read Psalm 115. I cited Psalm 135. And then we read Acts 28, all talking about the same sort of thing. How these idols, these images, have eyes but they don't see, ears but they don't hear, mouths but they don't speak, and so on. But the one that I wanted to read was Psalm 115 because it says, those that make them are like unto them. They're not seeing what they really should be seeing. They're not hearing what they really should hear. And I brought back our Lord and Savior's common saying, he that has ears to hear let him hear. Right? Hear the spiritual wisdom and, and understanding when he's teaching those things. And you and I that have trusted in the work of Christ, we have that promise that we have the mind of Christ and we can spiritually discern these things. So all those parables and all these words that we're reading here in Revelation, we can understand the true interpretation from. Because God is who he is, and he's, his desire is that we all come unto the knowledge of the truth. And that'd be a very silly desire if it wasn't possible, right? But God gives us that mind of Christ, so I fully believe it is possible that we can discern spiritually what is really going on from Genesis to Revelation. Yeah. <clears throat> Just to use a parallel, maybe not simply a parallel, from today, you know, you try and think about how can they do that given what they've seen in destruction. But in, in today's time, people have morality so upside down that they believe that what's wrong is right. And yeah. they, at their core, believe it. That, you know, whether it be sexual things or it be um, whatever, you know, the morality of it, uh, of things now, People that are Christians are judged for our for our values, for our morality. People that are Jewish are judged for their morality, and people that are uh, you know practicing rank immorality are held up as being moral and good. Mm -hmm. it, it it is not unbelievable given what we see today. That is, yeah, that is. Really fascinating you used even those exact words because I had those words in my head a few days ago and I wrote them down. Um, but you're right. Yeah, the, the morality is so turned upside down that as hard as it is to believe when we read these words when half the world's population is destroyed and how the people don't think, you know what? God's real and I should really believe and trust in what he's doing. That doesn't happen, by and large. There will be some that are saved, don't get me wrong about that, in the tribulation period, but you're right, they're so deluded with a strong delusion that they might believe a lie, right? That, that they, they stick along with this. So as I'm going to be talking, this is a great transition. Uh, if you want to turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and you think about, as you're turning to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, how the world at large is promoting immorality, calling evil good, calling good evil. All of those things are in our scriptures, and it's happening right now. It was also happening back then. Let's be clear about that. So it's not like it's brand new today. But what we've all experienced and what it seems like believers around the world are experiencing is that it's at a whole new level and that we're all just almost to that mindset where we're just exasperated, throwing our hands up and saying, okay, God, let's be done, let's get out of here. Right? Whereas before, it's, and maybe this is just me and my naivety, if that's even a word, 
uh, from even a decade ago when I just wanted to express, here's what the Bible says and what other ministry can I do and let's do this and let's do that. And we've all had those thoughts and I'm so thankful for those that are getting out with those thoughts and I still have them, but at the same time, I'm just like, no one's going to listen. You know? and, and which is you know, strange because I've never felt that way before. Now, I, I've always, I still do want to reach the lost, don't get me wrong. So it's just hard to express that thought, you know, but it's just, it's weird. It's in the back of my head, like, I don't know what else I can do. I keep trying and trying and trying, and, and I can only imagine, and perhaps it's, it's because I just read through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, you know, those two prophets that had the lovely job of God telling them, you go and tell these people the truth, but they're not going to listen. <laughs> over and over and over they were told you go do this but they won't listen they are a hard stiff necked people they're rebellious they're not going to listen you got to do this anyway man that had to be hard yeah right yeah and the Holy Spirit leading these things right otherwise it, it just won't happen um, Okay, let's read, before I digress some more, because we could easily you know, derail this train and start talking about current events and that sort of thing. Uh, if we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I almost want to read the entire epistle, to be totally honest, but it, it, it's because that the church in Thessalonica were having problems thinking they missed that rapture event. Okay? So they think now they're in that day of Christ, where he's going to make all things brand new. They are experiencing the wrath. It's coming. So you can imagine, because I've seen people that actually do this, you can imagine them freaking out about it, thinking, I missed it. Now I've got to survive somehow. And they're all out of sorts and all sorts of anxiety. But uh, let's read just chapter 2, verse 1. Paul writes, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that she be not soon shaken in mind, or by, be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, at that the day of Christ is at hand. Or literally, you're standing in it. Right? That's the uh, perfect tense of enhistemi in the Greek. It's so it's, you've already stood in it. Right? And when we look at these couple of verses, when he says, don't be shaken, don't be troubled, thinking about what he also says in 1 Thessalonians, Comfort one another with these words. We're going to be with him. Okay? That's the whole idea coming about here. And we can get the idea that they were tricked by someone forging a letter from Paul. That's what it says right there, nor by letter as from us. So whether they forged Paul or Silvanus or Timoth Timotheus, Timothy, as we would call him today, whatever the case, the church at Thessalonica was deluded into thinking that they're in that day of wrath. So Paul is saying, no, 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 let me talk to you about this. And he gets that comical, in verse 5, that comical verse, he says, don't you remember I told you this already? Right? But verse 3, let's not get too far ahead. Verse 3 says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? So he's reminding them, you're not in that tribulation period, because that will not happen, except there comes this falling away first, and that's the Greek term apostasia, and there's all sorts of debate about what that is. Okay? Uh, it could mean departure. It could mean desertion. It literally means standing away from Okay, that's what the Greek term is. And so that happens first. And so people are like, is that the rapture? Is that a falling away from the faith? Is that this, that, and the other thing? There's all sorts of different commentaries about it. But let's try to keep it in its context. What is he talking about? He's talking about the day of wrath. That day of wrath will not happen unless some departure or falling away happens first. What could that be? That also lines up with the rest of Scripture. And the Son of Man be... Re or, uh, the man of sin, very different term, man of sin is revealed. When does that happen? First seal judgment, right? That white rider on the white horse. Immediately when the tribulation period starts, here's this guy. He's revealed. They know who he is. 
He comes into his own, obviously, at the midpoint of the tribulation period. Verses 4, well, I guess just 4. Verse 4 talks about that. How that this son of perdition uh, uh, sits in the temple of God showing he is God. When does that happen? Midpoint of tribulation period, Revelation 13. The beast comes out, issues his mark, has that image erected. Now you worship me. Okay? So all of that stuff happens, and he's telling them this is what is going to be going on. But, verse 6, he says, now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. You know what's holding back that son of perdition so that he's revealed in his time, son of perdition's time, right? We're all on the same page so far? Okay. Because <clears throat> i got to make sure I'm on the right page, too. Uh, verse 7 says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's already happening. And before I go on into more of that, I don't think anyone would argue there sure is a work of iniquity going on here. And it seems like we, in our humanness, cannot stop it. That's what I was trying to express before, perhaps poorly. But I was trying to express that I, I pray all the time, every day. God, help me do the most I can every single day to express what does Scripture say, help ele edify people, elevate, I guess I could use that term too, who we are in Christ Jesus, to understand our identity in Christ Jesus, this amazing work that God did through His Son. Because it's liberating from all the worldliness and the sinfulness and all that stuff that's going on. It's that breath of fresh air. It's true life, right? It's found in these, these words, the, the Word of God. Try and get back on the rail. Um, Okay, so I, I was, you know, that's, that's at the, the bottom of my heart, top of my heart, whatever. I'm filled with that. That's what I want to do, <laughs> right? You see it every day. I don't hide anything here behind the pulpit. You, you see my emotion, how I'm really passionate about all of this. Uh, so I really want to do that, but at the same time, just like, I can't stop this. You know, like, it, it all keeps seeming to, to, to be building and building and building to something, right? I, can't, I was talking about that again this morning. I feel like I talk about it with somebody usually somebody different, every day, every week. Something's got to happen. We're at the brink of something. Well, God says that the mystery of iniquity is already at work. We, I don't think anyone argues that. It's still out there, still working toward that time frame, the tribulation time frame. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Or, quite literally, only the one is restraining at present until out of the midst it might be. And so we get the idea that the Holy Spirit, God is holding it back until all of a sudden, there it is. What better event can we think of to be that catalyst, to springboard into that, than when all the body of Christ, who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, is gone. Right? And so that's what I'm trying to get across here, is that 2 Thessalonians is explaining the chain of events a bug just flew in my eye, uh, that, uh, that has to happen before the tribulation takes place. Okay? So that this falling away happens first, then the Son of Man is revealed. The mystery of iniquity is already working, but God is restraining it until he pulls back the reins. Okay, now go. Open the seal. Here comes the rider on the right horse. Open the next seal. It's being let loose. Right? All of this stuff I just see working one in the same uh, message, story, timeline. Verse 8 then says, And then shall that wicked be revealed. So it's not till after the body of Christ is out of here, then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And we know that to be that same son of perdition, the one that's indwelt by Satan. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And that's quite the indictment against them too, if you think about it. They could have chosen salvation. It was a free gift available to all, but because they didn't receive it, that they could have been saved by that work through Jesus Christ. Now, verse 11, it says, And for this cause, because they rejected him, for this God, cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And even in that you see free will choice. And the, the whole point that I'm, I guess I'm trying to get off, which I honestly didn't 
think I would be talking about this this morning, all week, is that um, that that whole Egyptian account with Pharaoh and the Egyptians that continuously rejected God working through Israel is happening at the global scale. Now, all these people are still rejecting it, and God sends things that are definitely supernatural, definitely from Him, and yet they choose to harden their hearts against it. Okay, so again, that's all that's going to be taking place. God sends them the strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I can't help but read 13. But before I get in that, that's, that's describing those that rejected God, rejected truth, rejected life through Christ. Now God is giving them what they're asking for. He's a righteous judge. He's going to do that. Verse 13, though, to help those in Thessalonica, Paul writes, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath chosen from the beginning, or I'm sorry, hath from the beginning chosen you, period. No? <laughs> That's one of these verses that get twisted around that, that uh, Calvinists like to say, here, I'm part of the elect. And that's a verse. But they don't read it right. It says, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. God decided that the position of in Christ, or this identity of in Christ, the body of Christ, is available for all that belief. That's what he's saying. That is the chosen body. That is the elect. Just like in Israel when he said, this nation is the elect. And everyone that wanted to come to a, a, a saving, uh, to salvation of their sins would come through Israel. That was the elect. The body of Christ we know today is the elect. Hopefully this is all making sense. And those that, w that are part of the chosen, part of the called, are in the body of Christ, and they only get there by faith. It's not that God picked and chose before uh, anyone had a choice. It's because of the choice, because that is showing love. That's what love is. And so hopefully all that explains a lot of the controversies that are out there in, well, really the world, within Christianity, but also in the world. So that was their problem. They thought they were in the tribulation period. Paul says, oh, no, 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 you're not in there, because all these things have to take place first. And you need to be comforted together with all of these words, right? So that just correlates back with 1 Thessalonians. That's why I said we read both of those together. And quite honestly, 1 and 2 Thessalonians uh, don't take very long to read. You could probably read through both of them in 20 minutes or less and be edified and comforted by all of that. So this mystery of iniquity, it's already going on. Idolatry, spiritual fornication, witchcraft, wit wizardry, wi I can't even say it. Wizardry, spiritualism, another gospel. Yes, I'm air quoting that, but like the Sparkle Creed, I mean, what is that? That's totally messed up. What we talked about a couple weeks ago with um, the LGBT plus community making up their own Jesus, their own doctrine. That's another gospel, right? We can believe in a lie because they rejected the love of the truth. You were made in the image of God. You were not a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. The, totally beloved, totally valued, every single human being. <clears throat> but there are a lot of lies out there that sadly are believed instead of the truth. I seriously could derail a lot on this. Um, but they're believing lies. They're believing doctrines of devils. So let's talk about that for a moment. If you turn with me to 1 Timothy 4. So just to your right, maybe a page or two. 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writes, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats or from foods which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every, well, and he's going to go into that. We see that happening. Maybe I'll just leave it at that. 
the Spirit speaketh expressly that this is going to happen. There's a bazillion doctrines out there today. It's kind of crazy. And a couple hundred years ago, the church was fairly united in doctrine. I don't know if I can even say that properly. I don't know. Uh, it, probably can't. <laughs> it was pretty divisive. I, I guess we'll just say that. There just weren't as many denominations a couple hundred years ago as there are today. And most people acted a lot more neighborly, even when I was a kid, than they do today. Today, it's all like, we're going to hide behind our screens and do whatever we want. That's just the mentality of, of our generation today. But, uh, okay, I digress again. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. Idolatry. That's what it is. They're, they're going to be spreading lies and being passionate about these lies. A lot of the big name preachers out there are doing that. Preaching some other gospel. You have to do this. You've got to do that. And it's not what God did through Jesus Christ. Christ said it is finished for a reason. There isn't anything else to do. It is a sufficient work. He paid for the sin of the world. We just trust his work and that's it. There's no I have to. It should be I get to. I get to serve him. Yeah, it's a reasonable service, but I get to serve the God of all creation in this infirm body? Wow, what a nice deal. <laughs> and I get all those spiritual blessings even if I fail? Okay, I'm okay with that deal. Uh, but anyway... See, it's hard to, to stay focused. Um, let's turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 also. Mm, yeah, so we won't have a whole lot of time to get through this. So in that, that time frame of the tribulation period, right, we're, just, we're still trying to think in that mindset of what's going on, despite all the supernatural stuff, how they're hardened against all of that and won't let go of their idols. Uh, chapter 3 of 2 Timothy talks about the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own self, is verse 2. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. In the last days, all that stuff is going to happen within the church. Because all that stuff was already happening, but... That's what most will come to the conclusion of. He must be talking of within the church, because within the church, it was mostly united upon the finished work of Christ. But a lot of that seems to be totally out the window today, doesn't it? There are very few churches in the world that do what we do here on a regular basis, just preach from the scripture, try not to get off onto anecdotal psychobabble, I guess that's what I'll call it, uh, but to say, what does God's word actually say? That is what's life-changing. I do my best to read from Scripture and not change it, but to try and explain it as it is. Right? There's no cloak of covetousness here. I love that term in, in the Thessalonian epistles. <clears throat> I just try to present it the way it is. God says in the last times this is going to happen. I see this happening all over. So many preachers want to fill pews and, and chairs or whatever you want to call it for the sake of money. It's not for the sake of edifying the church. It's for the sake of money. And God talks about that. I don't need to get into that. I'm not one of those. I want to fill these pews, but for the sake of edifying the church, of who they are in Christ, and then let them go and start their own ministries. I even told up in Wisconsin, I'd rather have a revolving door here. People come in, get equipped, get understanding from the scriptures, go out, do the same. Like, I don't need... It's hard to say. I don't... <laughs> I don't desire the money, okay? I'll just put it that way. I need it. Yeah, everybody in the world needs money to, to function in their life, but that's not my goal, okay? Hopefully, I'm making sense with all of that, too. But by and large, the world is out there for filthy lucre's sake, to use the old English term, right? And that's what a lot of the big-name preachers are doing. Whether they realize it or not, that's what they're doing, trying to get people into this church. Remember that one I'll use his name. I, it doesn't matter to me because we need to know false teachers. Paul uses the false teachers' names. It was Kenneth Copeland. He said during the COVID lockdowns, you get that tied to that church, which is so wrong on many levels. Like, no, you don't have to do that. God loves a cheerful giver. That's what goes on today. We meet here and give to the church fund so that we've got lights running and electricity and all that good stuff, snacks out there and, and our potlucks or whatever, you know? That's what that's for. Hey, it's, it's not not to allow the preacher to live in a multi-million dollar home and have his own jet. 
Like that's not what that's all about. <sighs> Didn't want to get on that road. But the whole, the whole point of all of this is these lies and doctrines of devils are preached in pulpits, in churches that are called Christian today. And it's going to get worse and worse. If you look down to verse 13, it says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Right? That is what we ought to focus on. So even though it, all that stuff is going on, I could really read down chapter 4 through verse 5. Right? It, uh, so I'm going to. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, mature, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, the living and the dead, at his appearing, and his kingdom. And I see the Bema seat there, and the great white throne. And you can, might see some other things going on there, because he will also be judging during the millennial kingdom with that rod of iron. Okay, so he's allowed, he is the one righteous judge. But just before I digress more, verse 2 says, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables, unto myths. But wash thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Because we're all going to appear before that Bama seat of Christ, and he's telling Timothy, as a father does his son, go for it. Don't let anything hold you back. You do what's right so that you get your reward. That's coming to you. And he's going to finish on here about fighting the good fight of, and finishing his course, keep, course, keeping the faith. That should be our attitude, even though we see the world, and that's, you know, these are the verses that are repeating a lot in my head lately, how they will not endure sound doctrine, but heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That just seems like it's having its own snowball effect. I hesitate to use that term in Florida, but hopefully you get what that is. You start with a little snowball, and it just keeps accumulating, gets bigger, 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 bigger. Okay? It just seems to have that effect where more and more are departing from this. A lot of, well, not a lot, but several people that I have known who grew up with understanding what I will term mid-Acts dispensationalism, which really is just understanding what does the scripture say. They just let God say what he says and accept that as truth. A lot, m many people that I know of when I was young in the faith and starting off in it have left it. They've gone after other things, to universalism, to whatever, but they've left it. They were, they're taking that same path Demas is, did. Now, we've talked about Demas several times before in our message series, how that he followed with Paul for a while, but then left him for the present world because he loved the present world. And I want to encourage us not to be worldly, uh, and I didn't mean to get into preaching here this morning, but here we are, uh, and to live out our faith regardless of how the world reacts. We might be going through a time like Jeremiah and Ezekiel where we're going to live it out and we're going to preach the truth and nobody listens. That's not why we do it, though. Right? We do it because of what, uh, of what God did for us through Christ. He is our motivation. This is like a message part one. He is our motivation and we live our lives based on his work and what he did for us through Christ, not because of how many numbers can I get. Right? That's, again, what I'm trying to say. But to bring it all the way back around to finishing Revelation 9 this morning is that these men didn't repent of their, their sins, their idolatry. That is paving the way for them to worship the beast. Okay? And that was the whole point that I was trying to get across with all of that. And on that note, because we are at time, anyone have any lingering thoughts or comments? Yeah, Has Wycliffe or anyone produced a decent new for translation? <laughs> I'll have to look into that. Find the uh, the one new for translation of our Bible somewhere in the world. That would be great. Um, hey, what, wouldn't uh, <laughs> the teaching of the law be considered a different gospel at this point? 
Yeah, the teaching of the law would be a different gospel at this point. Uh, that is what Galatians was written against. So that is a, a good point. You have another? Yeah. It's the same gospel, eh? <laughs> yes. Don't you know? Yeah. It's the same gospel there. Oh, boy. Yeah, I could really... Maybe I'll do that one of these days. Just to keep you on your the edge of your seat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it'll go there. Sure. I'm, I'm sure. All right. So... Officially, we've finished Revelation 9 this morning. We'll jump into 10. Chump. <laughs> Slowly wait into chapter 10. It was probably more accurate next week. Let's pray. Uh, Lord in heaven, thank you again for this day that we can search your scriptures and find out truth. I'm thankful, Lord, for all the spiritual wisdom we can glean from it, the applications to everyday life. I'm so thankful that your word is living and active, that every day we can learn something new. I'm thankful for your Holy Spirit that unites us all, all of us that are sincere believers and trust uh, every word that you say. Even if we may not understand it, Lord, we do believe it and help us come to that understanding. Many people have questions, many people have differing doctrines, and I pray that we stand firm upon sound doctrine. Help us to be the example that shows the world that we can trust you. As silly as that thought is, rather than looking for someone to teach our own doctrine. Uh, Lord, we see it happening in the future. We see it happening today, knowing that the mystery of iniquity is already at work. I do thank you for restraining it even up to the present, knowing that that day, hopefully soon, is going to come when you call us home. Uh, but may we be found doing the work of an evangelist, uh, living out what, what you'd have us to do, uh, holding our body in subjection, that uh, we are keeping it, uh, possessing it as we should in that sanctification as you've written in your word that, um, that we live as a Christ child should. So uh, may we walk forward boldly that we may live out our life in Christ Jesus that pleases you always. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.